So we will talk about the context and the reasons for the study, um, the study approach, uh, key results and recommendations, and then we'll take questions as Diane described. Um, I want to start by thanking our partners. Um, our lead funder for this project was NOAA's Office of Habitat Conservation, and uh, very important additional support came from the Boeing Company and the Wildlife Forever Fund. And I also want to acknowledge um, the partnering organizations that helped make this happen, um, including ESA, which is Environmental Science Associates, Western Washington University, and the Earth Corps. Um, and in addition to uh, Dr. Crooks and I, um, there are several other authors of the report that we ought to acknowledge, um, including Dr. John Ritzik from Western Washington University, Keely O'Connell with Earth Corps, Danielle Devere from the ESA, and Katrina Pope, also from Western Washington University, and a number of people um, listed on your screen that have made very important contributions to the work that we carried out. So thank you to everyone, and as with most projects of this sort, um, it really does take a lot of expertise and a lot of commitment on behalf of a lot of people. So with that, I'm going to talk about um, what led us to doing this work and how it fits in uh, with our overall effort. Um, estuaries, as you probably know, are a very important ecosystem globally and in the US. Um, they contain many habitat types, including seagrasses, mangroves, salt marsh, and other tidal wetlands. Um, they provide habitat for fish and wildlife. Um, more than 75% of commercial uh, and 80 to 90% of recreational fish species depend on estuaries at some point in their lives. Um, and they also provide habitat for threatened and endangered species. Um, they can buffer storms and protect infrastructure in coastal communities. And they offer tremendous opportunities for outdoor recreation and related tourism. Um, last year, we released a report documenting the jobs and economic benefits of estuary restoration and learned that investing in restoration creates, um, on average, about 30 jobs per million dollars invested, uh, which is more than twice as many as the oil and gas and transportation industries combined. Um, as a further example of that, the Galveston Bay estuary in Texas supports more than 40,000 jobs in recreational and commercial fishing. Next slide, Diane. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are not protecting these places well enough and continue to lose habitat. Uh, historically, we've lost millions of acres of coastal wetlands to agriculture and development. And currently, we continue to lose 1 to 3 percent of these habitats globally and 80,000 acres per year um, in the U.S. And that U.S. figure is based on the most recent Fish and Wildlife Service Madison Trends Report. Um, and some of those U.S. losses are due to sea level rise and subsidence, um, but recent increases in the rate of loss are attributable to development pressures. Um, on the flip side, the good news is we know how to bring estuary habitat back to health, and there is a very strong national restoration community made up of scientists, practitioners, advocates, and volunteers from the government, nonprofit, consulting, and academic sectors. And, um, they gather every two years, as many of you know, at the Coastal Restoration Summit that is hosted by Restore America's Estuaries and the Coastal Society. Um, however, the current level of investment from both public agencies and private entities is not sufficient to come close to meeting our shared restoration goals. Blue carbon ecosystems, which include seagrasses, salt marsh, mangroves, and other tidal wetlands, uh, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through carbon sequestration, and they store it in the soils where it can remain for centuries or millennia. Um, coastal wetlands, on average, store two to five times more carbon in the soils than forest ecosystems. And that's the main difference between how wetlands uh, remove CO2 from the atmosphere and forests. Forests tend to put it into the trees, into the wood, and wetlands put it into the plants, but ultimately into the soils which build up over time. The reason we undertook this study was to provide a scientific assessment of the carbon sequestration benefits of estuary restoration at an estuary scale. It is the first of its kind. We're very excited about the results, uh, which you'll hear in just a few minutes. And taken together with 
the other ecosystem service benefits uh, I spoke about, uh, we believe it becomes very clear and, and very compelling that as a nation we need to invest now in achieving our estuary wetland restoration and protection goals. So we developed an approach that is fairly straightforward uh, and transferable to other estuary regions. Uh, and we, uh, in order to gain this better understanding of the carbon sequestration benefits of restoration. Um, and so the three parts of the approach are uh, first an analysis of the historic current and possible future conditions in the estuary. Um, also as part of the study, we measured soil carbon and carbon accretion rates at representative sites in the estuary. And then we applied those values um, and sea level rise uh, estimates um, to planned and full restoration scenarios um, that have been developed for that region as well. Um, so with that relatively high level introduction, um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Steve Crooks to take you into more depth um, in the study. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to give you a a quick overview of the main findings of the study. Um, there's a lot more detail in the report, um, so please go there. And if you have any further questions, do get in touch. Um, we selected, uh, for this analysis, we, we wanted to look in a, in a region uh, where there's a lot of active restoration ongoing um, and really get a sense of what the, the greenhouse gas implications are of restoring uh, wetlands. And so we, we selected a Snohomish estuary which is one of about a dozen estuaries in the Pacific Northwest within Puget Sound. And uh, it's the second largest estuary in Puget Sound. Um, ab above that is the, um, is the Skagit. And, uh, uh, and there are a number of other estuaries in the region. And it's, it's fairly typical. It's, it's lost around about 29% of its, of its wetlands. Um, it, represents, sorry, it represents around about 29% of wetland loss for the Puget Sound area. Uh, a number of things make wetlands particularly resilient in this part of the world, which makes them of, of great interest. And uh, here in the, in the Puget Sound area, it receives the whole Puget Sound receives around about 9 million tons of sediment delivered each year from the local catchment. And uh, the Snohomish is no different to that of other estuaries. So it's a very exciting place to, to, to look in terms of this kind of assessment. Um, this figure here shows our project boundary. Uh, we were working primarily down in the lower estuary. And you see the starred points, which are our sample locations. And I'll provide more detail of those. Um, but our project boundary, we extended upstream. And we included one meter of sea level rise uh, on top of the topography to give us a, a sense of where the estuary will be uh, with future sea level rise. Uh, we don't define a time on that. Uh, but we define that we recognize that we will get to that elevation at some point in the future. And so we wanted to look at how resilient the wetlands would be with sea level rise and what the distribution would be into the future. Now, historically, uh, what once existed, and in a moment I'll show you a graphic of the historic conditions, what once existed of, of uh, forested scrub shrub and tidal wetlands, 4,749 hectares of those wetlands, and I'm going to work in metric, if you'll forgive me, and uh, were lost and converted to agricultural um, or other uses. Um, now and ongoing are a number of restoration plans. And uh, 1,353 hectares of planned restoration are uh, ongoing. Um, the Kualut project, for instance, uh, in the, which is in the top uh, left-hand corner, um, is planned for construction uh, this year. And other islands like Spencer and uh, Smith Island are, are in progress. Here's a view of the historic condition. Um, the sort of blue stipply is, uh, re represents the distribution of forested and scrub shrub wetlands, which represented roughly about 69% of the total estuary at the time, uh, grading gradually down into emergent uh, tidal marshes. And this is very common in most of the estuaries of the Pacific Northwest. Um, over time, these wetlands were cleared, the forest was cut down, and the soils were drained. Uh, at that time, they would release CO2 back to the atmosphere. Unlike many estuaries, which have a distribution of emergent marshes predominantly, uh, the Pacific Northwest did have marshes which built up above marsh plain elevations. And I'll come back to what that means 
in a little while, and they had uh, more organic more organic soils that were flooded by high tides and by high water as they came down the rivers, leading the wetlands at above marsh plain elevation. And when they were drained, they lost that carbon as well as the carbon that existed at marsh plains. What we hoped to do was try and get a sense of a number of parameters. Um, one, what were the historic emissions that occurred when the lands were drained, when the wetlands were drained? Um, do we believe or suspect, is there any evidence that emissions may be ongoing? And we weren't able, as part of this project, to do direct measurements of emissions on the existing lands. Um, but what we did do is we looked at the distribution of uh, soils and uh, get a sense of their organic content, which helps us infer whether emissions are still taking place. Now in the analysis that I'm going to talk about in a little while, we don't include the emissions which will be CO2 from any drained wetlands which are existing on farmland, or where the farmland has been ab abandoned and water elevations have raised. There'll be methane emissions from ditches and methane emissions from the soils potentially. As we couldn't quantify this, we haven't included in the analysis. But the numbers therefore mean um, in the, that are provided as part of this report are conservative in that we are not adding to that the emissions that were coming from the existing baseline condition. So the soil distribution, we find we, there are three major soil formations in this uh, region. The Makilto, which has around about 20 to 40 percent organic matter, and that is the uh, sort of pale green color. The Snohomish formation, 10 to 20 percent, and the Puget Sound formation, 5 to 10 percent. So dominantly, there are organic soils here. Some are very organic, which would be um, designated as peats uh, under many definitions. So this system uh, was had a wealth of organic soils. And so we infer from this, but we have not quantified, um, that these, these, um, these soils are likely emitting CO2 continuously as part of a baseline condition. Where soil water elevations are high, we would expect also to find methane emissions uh, as well. This map gives the distribution of planned restoration activities uh, within the project area. And uh, the Kulud project is, is site number two, which is about to, be, to go into construction. And other, other projects, such as Smith Island there. All of these are planned projects. So these projects are not goals, but are actually in the planning process that money is, is, is flowing towards. So these are real projects that we can use for our planning scenarios. And in our, in our future looking forecast, uh, we, took, um, we looked at these scenarios and we also looked at what a full estuary, full estuary restoration would also include. But our analysis was not all theoretical. Uh, we based our analysis about, about the, uh, some field analysis of the 12, of 12 field sites. And this field analysis was uh, developed by um, Dr. John Ribsig and his uh, wetlands crew at uh, WWU University. Um, soil cores were collected at three natural sites, five restoring sites, and four potential uh, restoration sites, or sites which are still under other land uses right now. Of these cores, five were um, dated using radiometric approaches to get a sense of what the uh, sediment accumulation rate is. So that gives us a sense of how robustly the um, existing restoration sites and what I should have mentioned, and I'll come back to, uh, North Evey Island is one example in this estuary where uh, the levees breached naturally during a flood, and the wetland has been restoring on its own uh, over a 40-year period. So we have at that site a record of 40 years' worth of wetland accumulation over time. And we have uh, radiometric dating as part of this, which gives us a sense of the rate of sediment accumulation. And we, from that, we can also use the carbon data to get a sense of rate of carbon sequestration. Great, thank you. Uh, and so this, this graphic here, it shows a number of things. And I'll, I'll run through the bottom graphic first. Um, this represents the elevation of each of our sites. That we, uh, that we sampled from natural areas, restoring areas, and possible restoring areas, restoration areas in the future. The elevation is in meters NAVD, so it's, in, it's a, an elevation relative to a datum. 
And the green, the green hatching represents the elevation at which vegetation comes into a site. El uh, vegetation in tidal areas is very sensitive to hydrology. And approximately in this area is the elevation at which emergent vegetation uh, begins transferring from uh, mudflat to vegetated marsh. And this marsh then builds up through time until it reaches what's known as the marsh plain elevation which tends to be around about mean high, high water, or if you're in another part of the country, mean high water springs. And we see, for instance, here that two sites, Heron Point and Otter Island, have built up right to that elevation there. The Quilicida Marsh is still building towards that elevation. And that our other sites um, are lower than that. And that reflects that when these wetlands were drained, the soil subsided. Part of that is carbon emission. Part of it is water loss and the soil drops in elevation. But in this particular estuary, most of the estuary is within the elevation at which vegetation would come back in again. Here is a North Eby Island site, which has been accreting for 40 years, and is well within the vegetation colonization range. And in this island, uh, Spencer Island, which I'll come to as well, uh, and then Smith Island are restoring sites. Spencer Island is within the vegetation range. Smith Island is just approaching it. So taking us to the top figure, here we have direct measurements from radiometric dating uh, provided by John's group, which show us the rate of carbon, which shows the rate of soil buildup in this, each area. Heron Point and Otter Island are both within at natural marsh plain elevations and are, are gradually building up. Spencer Island is a uh, recently um, uh, restored site, five years old, and that's building up at three millimeters per year, which is a good healthy rate. It's above that, just above that for the rate of sea level rise. But North Eby Island, which has been building up, has been building up at a constant rate at the, the location where we sampled of over a centimeter per year. And that is consistent with a previous study um, that was done 10 years ago, which documented around about one centimeter per year of marsh building at a constant rate over the last 40 years. And so this is very encouraging. It gives us a sense that in this area, because of both the combination of high sediment availability, but also because of the species which are present, there is good restoration potential in these systems. Uh, the species are bulrushes, which are common along much of the west coast in fresh to brackish uh, settings. And the reason they're particularly resilient is uh, they put down rhizomes, which are pretty effective at building organic soils. When you look at the rate of carbon accumulation, uh, being measured. The high marshes are accumulating carbon at somewhere between uh, 0.6, oh sorry, uh, 60 uh, grams of carbon per meter squared per year, uh, or 173, up to 173 uh, grams of carbon uh, per meter squared per year, which equates roughly to, if you average the two, to one gram per meter squared per year, or one ton per hectare, or four tons, just under four tons per hectare of CO2 per year. North Eby Island, because it's building faster, is actually sequestering carbon at a higher rate, which is roughly um, four tons of CO2 per year, or roughly, sorry, four tons of carbon, or four tons of CO2 per hectare per year uh, on the restoration side. So that's very promising. And this is what carbon density data looks like. It's, uh, you, you combine um, a bulk density with organic carbon content, and you get this key parameter of carbon density, and you measure it through the soil, uh, soil column. Most marshes have a carbon density somewhere between 0 0.02 to 0 0.04 grams per centimeter per, uh, uh, cubed. Uh, there are a few marshes outside of that range, but dominantly within that range. And so what we're seeing here of carbon densities around about 0 0.025 are very typical for many marshes in many parts of the world. In this case, this marsh has been building up for 40 centimeters, uh, built up 40 centimeters over 40 years. And this is the profile here. Here's Spencer Island. So this is the former breach surface, the former agricultural surface here. And this has been building up sediments also at a similar kind of rate. Now, to determine the emissions which have been um, have resulted historically, uh, but also to determine the uh, sequestration into the future, uh, we, took, we took what's known as a hypsometric approach. It's a common uh, approach used by geomorphologists. And basically what you look at is the existing topography 
uh, in reference to either area uh, area distribution or um, to volume distribution. And so this line here, we'll look at the um, the area distribution, shows the topography of the site. So uh, less than around about 1,000 hectares of the site are at elevations below one meter. And that roughly represents the colonization elevation of the vegetation. And then 4,000 hectares of the site fall at this elevation below marsh plain. And then with sea level rise, that area will extend. And with one meter of sea level rise, we'll have over 5,000 hectares of the site um, below that marsh plain elevation. And so what we can determine here, um, looking forward, is the amount of carbon that would be accumulated. Actually, I'll turn to the volume curve that would fill, if we know the carbon density, we can calculate the amount of carbon that would accumulate within the space that's filled by rebuilding marshes. Historically, um, there were uh, 1.7 million tons of carbon, that's carbon, not CO2, released uh, from these soils. But more so at the, uh, from the above ground biomass, the forests, 2.8 million tons of biomass, of carbon from biomass were released when the forests were cut down. Now I'm going to give you the key results. Uh, there's a lot more uh, detail and color in the uh, main report. Um, so I, I would um, direct you there. But the key results to overlook are that for the existing projects, planned restoration projects, building back up, we would expect to yield and gain around about 1.1 million tons of CO2 as these, mar as these marshes build back up to sea level, as back up to marsh plain elevation. Now we can be we're relatively confident in that number because the observed rates of accretion uh, on EB Island are in, in excess of that uh, of natural sea level rates. So it's a very promising result. Planned restorations, if you add on the one meter of sea level rise, uh, would accumulate an additional uh, 1.4 million uh, tons of CO2 into the future. Now we don't know the timeline of that. But we do know that when the marshes build up, it will eventually get to that level. Uh, total CO2 sequestered under the existing planned restoration projects are of the order of 2.5 million tons of CO2. Now, for those of us who don't work on soils all the time, in terms of uh, maybe uh, an, an equivalent emission, that would be equivalent to one year's worth of cars driving around of 500,000 or 5,000 cars driving around for 100 years. If we would expand the restoration to include the rest of the estuary, then we can expand the analysis again using the uh, carbon density numbers and the volumetric approach. Full restoration of 4,393 uh, hectares would yield a total of four, just under uh, 4 1⁄2 million tons of CO2. Full restoration with sea level rise would yield an additional 4.4 uh, uh, million tons yielding CO2 sequestration of 8.9 million tons overall. Now this is equivalent to emissions of around about 1.6, 1.76 million cars in one year, or around about 17,600 cars driving around each year for 100 years. So as part of that analysis, um, we also included the methane emissions to get a sense of uh, what, you know, how much would it still be a net negative uh, project overall? And um, it is, we include that and the details are in the report. Uh, it roughly brings down the net GHG uh, sequestration by about a factor of 50%. So it's still very much a very positive project. But when you also account, when it's possible to account for the baseline condition, that would bring back up the sequestration rate again. So here we're providing the carbon uh, numbers. In the main report, we also provide the methane numbers to go with that for the with project condition. Now the key results in the, um, the project is the emergent restoration projects in Snohomish are very resilient to sea level rise. Um, however, what we should also add is that it is beneficial to restore these wetlands now while the elevations are at or close to the vegetation colonization elevation. Doing so allows a period of time for the vegetation to establish and for marsh building to, uh, to, 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 take, to take place. The approaches, as Steve mentioned earlier on, that have been developed within this study are transferable. 
and it provides an approach where you could look at other restaurants in other parts of the country to assess what the uh, restoration opportunities are. Each part of the country will have a different opportunity. They have, will have different species. They will have different sensitivity to sediment availability. So it, it's important to look in different parts of the country and see what those opportunities are. But the approach developed here would be transferable to other systems. In terms of limitations and assumptions, I'll come back to that. Um, while we use default values for the emergent marshes, it would be beneficial to have actual monitoring take place within these sites. We have a relative degree of confidence within the, emerge, uh, the uh, emissions factor that was we adopted from the IPCC uh, recent guidance. The number that we use is very similar to a number that's been measured in California for managed wetlands with similar species. Um, but real numbers, actual numbers collected on site would greatly improve the resolution and reduce the error bars of that analysis. Equally, we would recommend that uh, methane and nitrous oxide be quantified in the baseline condition on the existing drained agricultural soils. As much as possible, we've, we've, we've tried to be conservative in our analysis, so erring on the side of caution in the numbers that we've developed and in the numbers we use in the report. And so the main conclusions is that um, the, the project demonstrates robust recovery, pro existing projects demonstrate robust recovery of wetlands, and this is transferable to what we might see in other parts of, of Puget Sound. They have a very high capacity to respond to rates of sea level rise, and this illustrates the, the climate change mitigation benefits of tidal wetlands uh, restoration and conservation. Each coastal region is going to be different and hold different opportunities as well as different constraints. There's a need to look at each coastal region of the U.S. and provide uh, guidance on restoration and protection actions that could reduce greenhouse gas emissions and provide for uh, future climate change adaptation and cre create other ecosystem services, economic benefits, including jobs. This work supports carbon project development and will become possible with approval of the global tidal wetlands restoration methodology that Restore America's estuaries have submitted to the verified carbon standards. It also provides an approach to support state and national GHG accounting for wetlands management and uh, as called under the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. And with that, I'll hand it back to Steve. Am I on? Yes, but you're a little bit quiet. If you could speak up, Steve. Thank you. I will. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that uh, and a very clear presentation of the study. Um, I wanted to take a, a couple minutes to talk about some recommendations for, um, for how to use this work going forward and how to expand upon uh, the results that, uh, that we've just heard. So for the Pacific Northwest region where this study took place, um, we would recommend that there be a regional blue carbon working group uh, established to inform science and planning activities. And um, along those lines, uh, we and some other partners, um, including NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service, have been leading uh, blue carbon managers workshops um, for Oregon and Washington. And uh, through those, hope to develop additional local capacity around blue carbon. Um, secondly, we would um, advise uh, an expansion of the scope of this work to other estuaries within Puget Sound, um, and so we can find out uh, what the blue carbon benefits of restoration would be in those areas compared to the Snohomish, and learn more about the various things that would influence that. Um, third, as Steve mentioned, the study did not assess current emissions in the landscape. Uh, from methane, nitrous oxide, um, or carbon dioxide, um, or potential emissions um, that could occur with restoration, uh, and that would primarily be methane, but might also be nitrous oxide. And so having this picture, um, I think would be a, a more complete picture of uh, the overall net greenhouse gas benefits of estuary restoration. Fourth, um, identifying and developing pilot projects uh, would help to uh, demonstrate how carbon finance um, or other incentives 
can help move restoration forward in the region. Uh, and one way to do this would be to use the uh, greenhouse gas methodology for tidal wetlands and seagrass restoration uh, that we have just submitted to the verified carbon standard for approval. Uh, the public review for that will begin in just a week, actually. Um, and for those of you on the call, we'll make sure you receive notification of that. And then fifth um, is to scale up our investment in restoration and protection um, in these important ecosystems. Taken with the other ecosystem services, as I've said before, it's, it's really more clear than ever how much uh, we human beings depend on estuaries. And it is time to make a high-level commitment to meeting our estuary restoration goals. At the national level, we also have a series of recommendations on the next slide. Thank you. Um, and some of them are parallel with the regional recommendations. So the first thing would be to establish a national blue carbon working group. Um, and we'll be working with, uh, with NOAA and other partners uh, to begin that process um, in just the next couple of months. Um, and secondly, uh, additional research and analysis of greenhouse gas, grasses, and, and estuary wetlands, but particularly connecting it to management options uh, would be a valuable step to take so that coastal land managers um, can understand uh, any available options or benefits um, or, or downsides of specific management uh, actions they might take. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, this uh, approach is transferable, and every estuary is different, um, and so to carry this approach out in other estuaries would give us a much better understanding of greenhouse gases in other regions um, and overall and really help move this forward. To assist reporting on greenhouse gases um, under the new IPCC guidelines, uh, they are calling for um, participating countries to begin uh, looking at wetland emissions and reductions um, in greenhouse gases. And that's something that uh, you know, this work supports um, and we can assist going forward. Um, number five, integrating climate mitigation, adaptation, and restoration actions um, at the local level. So restoration and conservation efforts should be coupled together going forward to ensure long-term survival of wetlands as sea levels rise. And now we know that restoration um, can have significant climate mitigation benefits as well. So linking these three, these three things together should uh, provide tremendous benefits going forward. For the same reasons, we recommend pilot projects for the Pacific Northwest. We also recommend them uh, in other places uh, in the US, um, again, to demonstrate um, how blue carbon projects can work in specific landscapes. Um, Number seven, uh, Duke's Nicholas Institute and NOAA um, have been exploring options for integrating blue carbon considerations into existing statutes, regulations, and policies. These could include, for example, um, NEPA analyses, uh, the National Natural Resources Damage Assessments that occur, um, and Clean Water Act permitting reviews and requirements. Uh, and I think further work in that area would be very beneficial and could help in the long run towards protecting and restoring these ecosystems. And then last, um, consistent with our mission and, and our goal uh, of pursuing the blue carbon work, um, we are calling for increased investment, uh, both public and private, in estuary wetland restoration and protection, um, because we know without a doubt uh, the tremendous services and values that they provide to us. And I will stop there. And I believe we will shift to questions at this point. And thank you again for your attention today. Well, thank you um, so much, Steve um, and Steve. <laughs> um, this has been really, really great um, for you to both give us an overview of Blue Carbon, um, really walk us through the report results, um, and, now, um, and now to start thinking about some of the opportunities moving forward. Um, you know, I think just from my own perspective, um, forest carbon has long had, had the recognition um, for us, you know, for their climate mitigation uh, benefits and their ability to sequester carbon. And um, this, this research is really um, what it's going to take in order to get us to that same place with coastal tidal wetlands. So thank you both. 
So um, in addition to um, Environmental Science Associates and Restore America's Estuaries, I want to again thank um, Earth Corps and Western Washington University uh, for their, their direct contribution on the, the, and leadership on, in this report, um, and also NOAA's Office of Habitat Conservation, the Boeing Company, and Wildlife Forever Fund, um, who helped provide the funding that made this possible. So I'd like to open um, this discussion um, up to everyone who's on the phone. Um, you have two options. One would be to uh, submit a question um, through the question uh, box or to raise your virtual hand. Uh, that will allow me to see that you have a question and um, unmute your line. Um, I've got a queue of questions that are building up here in the question box. So I'll start with um, Robert O'Sullivan. Um, his question is, would any of the accumulation be lost to, uh, when the sea level rises, i.e., the submerged uh, carbon subsequently lost effort after it becomes permanently underwater? Steve Crooks, I think. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, nice to, nice to even see you again. Um, yes, it's a good question. Uh, if, if the carbon is submerged, then it, it largely stays in place. It stays in place. And um, as, as these marshes build up, buried carbon accumulates within the soils, and we'll, we'll, you know, the more inconsequent stuff will, will stay there. Um, the question then becomes, well, how do these wetlands respond to sea level rise? Most wetlands migrate landwards with sea level rise. And what was interesting about this particular setting is that the wetlands look particularly robust to staying in the same location. They can build uh, relatively rapidly because of the sediment supply, but also because of the type of vegetation. And so there's quite likely the chance that th these wetlands will stay in the same location and migrate backwards at the back end um, with, with seal rise. So, so the fore end will, will stay in the, in the same geographical location. Speaking more generally, though, the question becomes for tidal wetlands, what happens if sea level rises at a rate greater than they can sustain? And whereas in this case, the very high um, uh, sustainability, the high resilience of sea level rise, in other locations, if they can't migrate, then they drown out. In that, in that case, then ongoing sequestration um, halts at that time. What happens to the uh, sediment if it's redistributed? Well, that's a, a good question. And it, it reflects, you know, the best thinking right now is that it reflects the geomorphic uh, setting. If you're in, say, the, the um, Mississippi Delta and a storm comes through, maybe a hurricane once every 50 years in a certain location, that carbon which builds up in the soils will be redistributed. It will pass through the water column but be uh, rapidly uh, buried again on the adjacent mudflat. So most of that material will be reburied again. It's now redistributed um, across, the, across the wider landscape. And that, in fact, is, you know, is, the, is the origin of many oils and deltaic systems. Um, but the cases where that wouldn't happen would be situations where you have something like a, a sediment efficient system and a carbonate shelf where the sediment is redistributed uh, and then it lies on an open rock surface and in that case would be oxidized and returned back to the atmosphere. But most of the coastal systems around the U.S. are sandy or uh, sediment uh, dominated and we'd expect most of the, the, the carbon just to be reburied re again uh, within adjacent sediments. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've got a great question from Roanne Patrell. Her question was, have the private residences and farmers embraced wetland restoration around their properties within the Washington region? Um, it's, uh, I, I'm not a, a great expert of the, the uh, politics of Washington region, except they, they are doing an awful lot of, of great practice in terms of wetlands restoration. Um, in most communities, it, it's a mixed feeling. Um, some landowners um, are encouraging to see more wetlands restoration either because they do want to move on their land or they want to do an environmental benefit and, and keep the land for themselves. In other settings, it's something where farmers would rather prioritize other activities. And most coastal settings, really what we, we hope to see is a rich mosaic of, of healthy communities which incorporate a level of, of restoration but also in, uh, in, incorporate a, a level of of good farming practices. What we're hoping to do here is just make aware to people what the greenhouse gas implications are of, of wetlands management. And then, um, through, and also looking at whether th there is potential to use carbon financing or other mechanisms, open up new opportunities to those landowners. And so we'll see what, what bubbles up in the future, but it's, as we see in the Snohomish, already around about 25% of the, of the estuary has undergone some form of planning towards wetlands restoration. 
that may be the end of it, or maybe new landowners will be interested in exploring options for more wetlands restoration. Our next question uh, comes from Mark. Um, he's interested in, um, you mentioned constructed wetlands in California having similar results, and he's curious if these results are published. A good question. Uh, some of the results are published. You can look to the work of people like Steve Deverell, who I, I imagine is right on this call. Uh, but also, uh, um, there was um, papers by uh, Robin. Oh, sorry, Robin, I forget your name. But I'll, 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 I'll have a, a brainstorm there. Um, but uh, th there were a number of papers that have come out of the managed wetlands uh, folks, USGS and um, Department of Water Resources in, in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And so I can, we can connect you to those papers. I know there are also additional studies which have been ongoing. Uh, well, there are actually additional studies also produced on the greenhouse gas accounting um, out of Berkeley University and um, by Dennis Baldocci's uh, group. And there's also ongoing stories, other studies that have also taken place which have not yet been published by the USGS, which have been looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, on that site and on adjacent sites, uh, farmland, which are uh, yet to be published. And that work has been undertaken by Lisa Marie Winder Myers. So I would, uh, I would uh, push you on to those authors. And if you want f uh, additional follow-up information, I'd be very happy to provide that. And uh, his follow-up question was, have there been any similar studies of carbon related to nearshore kelp marine forests? Interesting question. Um, not in the US that I'm aware, but in South Korea and across Asia, there is more interest in that. Um, the interesting thing about kelp, or how it fits into the blue carbon uh, paradigm, is primarily for blue carbon, we're looking to accumulate organic matter within below ground, uh, as, within below ground, within soils. Kelps are different to that. They normally exist on rocky substrates, um, or and they, the, the biomass is largely like like terrestrial forests is largely in the above ground biomass. So the the Koreans are looking at this, um, but I, my suspicion about how the the numbers will play out is that. The numbers are not that great. We're really looking for soil accumulation. Where the kelp might be interesting is in kelp harvesting. If kelp becomes something like a biofuel, a substitute for a biofuel, it may be more um, valuable in terms of a re renewable resource that could be farmed rather than building up a single carbon stock kelp forest. Um, it maybe it's more of a biofuel issue. But you know you can always do the accounting for the expanse of kelp forest and see what the the carbon value is of, of, of conserving any of those kelp forests at risk. Um, our next question is from Doug Myers. Um, is Kulot, I mean, Kul not, thank you, um, is it preparing itself as a carbon offset project given that you have the necessary data to establish a baseline? Um, no, uh, and I, I expect, you know, um, Steve uh, may chip in and talk about the additionality question in a, in a second. Um, but largely projects which have been planned already um, would, not be a, would not be recognized as carbon projects. The idea of the, the carbon financing is that it provides an additional incentive for new projects to come online. Um, however, the value of the project, the Kulut project, could be recognized by the project partners and by the community because it will have net carbon benefits, net greenhouse gas reduction benefits. And so this is something that could be recognized as a benefit an additional ecosystem service along with everything else, um, but it would not be eligible for carbon financing because it's already in progress. From Eric Swenson, um, what plants are you using other than bulrushes? Uh, in this system, we're not using plants specifically. It's the natural uh, fauna, uh, flora in the region. And um, the species which are dominant here um, include uh, Carex uh, lingbi, and, uh, and this bulrush. And they happen to be both pretty prolific in building soil carbon. When you get down into um, California, uh, other bulrushes are present which are equally prolific. And so to, to look around the, the, the states, you would look for to see what the, um, the local native species would be and how they fit into this carbon accumulation rate. Not all marshes have a high carbon accumulation rate. In San Francisco Bay, pickleweed, you know, produce, it does produce uh, root matter, but it's not in the volumes that we would see in situations where further up the estuary, in San Francisco estuary, 
where you get into bull rushes that you find these kind of carbon accumulation rates. Our next question is from Kristen Wilson. In the volumetric approach, how do you deal with spatial variability in carbon density? Do you average over the entire study region? Uh, another good question. At, at this level, we were providing a scoping level assessment of what the uh, potential numbers would be. If you were getting into a more detailed project, then you would have to, uh, what they say is stratify the landscape. You look to the variability across the landscape. Here we stratified to some degree. We sampled where there were uh, forested uh, wetlands, where there were scrub shrub wetlands, and where there were emergent wetlands. Um, but when it came to the restoration sites, we're primarily looking at emergent wetlands again and our sampling reflected that. If, however, you had another system, you would stratify again based upon the different types of ecosystems that you might find, and you would also subsample within each of those ecosystems to get a sense of the variability. Interestingly, work done by John Calloway in San Francisco Estuary, we sampled across a, a number of marshes that were natural marshes, not restoring marshes, found very little variability from one site to another which might suggest that the amount of uh, variability in carbon accumulation is not that great. But for every new study, every new region that you go into, you really will have to go through the work of stratifying the landscape and determining the number of carbon samples that would be required. Any questions for Steve? Sorry, Steve, I, I may have skipped you on, um, on one of the questions. Did you have something to add? Well, going back to Doug Meyer's question and Steve Crook's comment on additionality, um, I, just for those who, who don't uh, don't have an understanding of carbon offsets yet, um, offsets uh, are intended to um, uh, be an offset uh, or balance to new emissions or de decrease sort of our net emissions. And so, to the extent that um, something is already going to happen. Uh, giving that an offset credit um, would not be consistent with that goal. So as Steve was saying, uh, and, and that concept is called additionality, and uh, as Steve was saying, projects that are already underway, um, it would be hard to argue that they are additional um, and should receive credits. Uh, but for projects still in planning that need additional support or funding, um, those are cases where it would be um, proper uh, or appropriate uh, to consider offsets. Thank you. Um, a question from Laura Brophy. Can we expect mineral sedimentation rates to scale proportionately across an entire estuary given available total sediment loads for the river system? Or is it possible a single restoring site in a diked landscape might receive a disproportionate load compared to a similar acreage within a fully restored estuary with no dikes remaining. Hi, Laura. Uh, thanks for that question. Good question. Um, sediment uh, distribution is, large, is, is, is quite variable, of, of course. Um, you may find within a single marsh, you know, sandy levees and nearby more organic soils. Um, when, you, when we look at the Snohomish, you can see within the historic soil map the variability in the distribution of um, organic and mineral soils. And that reflects the variability um, across the estuarine landscape. So uh, what I would also add is that um, when you think about sediment availability, you, you, you're kind of looking to see, to get a sense of how the wetlands are going to respond to sea level rise. Um, the more mineral sediment available, the more resilient those wetlands will be. Um, equally, you're, also, you're looking to the vigor of the plants Bull rushes are particularly resilient. Other species are fairly resilient, such as uh, Spartinas on the east coast. And you're looking to get a sense of, of, of both of those. There's, there's largely a threshold. You need a certain amount of mineral sediment available. And then if there's a, above any mineral, above that threshold, it's, it, the variability can be considerable, and the, the marsh will respond in the same way. So if we were to take your question and extrapolate it a little bit, and you were to look in other parts of the country, you might want to look at different management approaches when thinking about uh, your, your restoration uh, activities and how that affects your carbon budget. So while here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're seeing very resilient marsh building and potentially very resilient response to sea level rise, if you were in somewhere, let's say, Florida, which um, does not get much sediment supply in most of the coastline, you would have to look to different restoration practices to balance your mitigation and adaptation strategies. 
So if you went to say somewhere like uh, Tampa Bay or anywhere else along the coastline, what you're really looking to do there would be to be creating space for wetlands to move into. And so you know, UC grasses will come along with silverized, but you need space for the mangroves to move into. Um, this kind of thinking about the sediment supply would be a mute point in, in most parts of Florida. It's a different, a different strategy. So we've just got a, a couple more minutes remaining, so I'm going to try to group a few of these. Um, um, these two um, uh, are, um, have you considered eelgrass meadows? And if so, how would you measure carbon accumulation? Also, have you taken into account um, warmer water temperature and the change in species migrating north? Um, two different questions, but. Two, two linked questions, good questions. Um, eelgrass, uh, we didn't consider eelgrass in this study. Um, there are a number of people working on carbon accumulation within seagrasses. Um, there was a paper published in Nature um, last year by uh, James Falkran et al. from Florida International University, summarizing the, the global state of the science with relations to carbon accumulation uh, by seagrasses. And in the uh, methodology that Restore My Gazestries have submitted to the Verified Carbon Standards for Review, we include a, the um, potential for seagrass projects to fall under that methodology. So that's very promising. Here in the Snohomish, uh, there weren't any eelgrasses to really consider, at least within the region that we were working in. Um, but in other, other situations, other settings, Florida, Chesapeake Bay, um, the Salish Sea, uh, to the north of this site, uh, they may be more important uh, parts of the carbon cycle that should be included in analysis. Um, the second question was? Um, related to water temperatures and um, change in species migrating north. Uh, that's a good question. We didn't look at that, and that uh, is also something that is definitely worth considering. Here, this particular species goes considerably further south along the Oregon coastline and into Washington, into California, and so we weren't at the end of a range here for this particular species. And other parts of the country, you may, you will certainly want to look into whether you're at the, at the threshold for any given species and consider that as part of your your planning, or your feasibility assessment, or your vulnerability assessment. Um, a question from Tori uh, Leading from IACF International. How do tidal mudflats compare to marshes in terms of carbon sequestration potential? Ah. Now, uh, tidal mudflats do accumulate carbon. Um, but primarily, when we're thinking about blue carbon systems, we focus on emergent vegetated wetlands. Or we, we, we focus on vegetated wetlands. Seagrasses, of course, are, are not emergent. And uh, the reason for that is there's a direct route that you can point to where CO2 is extracted from the atmosphere, or in the case of seagrass, is extracted directly from the water column and transferred and, and deposited within soil. And so you can account for that what's called um, autochthonous carbon sequestration, or on-site carbon sequestration. Mudflats uh, do, do not, do not uh, sequester CO2 directly through that, uh, that route through the plant. And so while they do sequester carbon, or they do hold carbon that is accumulated from other sources, such as coming down river deltas and being buried within the mudflat as a final uh, point of deposition, uh, we, we don't tend to focus on that because there's a concern that we might be double counting for carbon which has been accounted for somewhere else in the landscape. So we focus on the vegetated wetlands where the carbon accounting is clearer. Down the line, there may be new science which can expand on that question but for now, we focused on the that direct uh, autochthonous carbon accumulation. Um, so our final question call um, comes from Paul Stacey. Um, he says, um, has anyone looked at the marsh vertical accretion and potential higher exposure to erosion and slumping, a result of the increasing depth differential of adjacent open water, uh, which would likely accrete at a much lower rate? Um, would that lead to area losses and less sequestration than estimated from sea level rise? Uh, another good question. Um, really, when you, when you look at these studies, you've got to take the geomorphic context. Um, you've got to take the geomorphology in context. And so, yes, there have been a number of studies which have, have looked at um, marshes in different settings. Some marshes, for instance, uh, such as Elkhorn Slough, um, are eroding now and, uh, and will be losing carbon resources as part of that process. In other estuaries, they will respond differently to sea level rise. Um, if you understand the geomorphic context of each marsh or each estuary, then you can get a sense of how these systems will respond to sea level rise, and then factor that in 
to your planning for uh, carbon accounting, as well as adaptation planning. So I think, yes, it's a good question, very good question. Um, but the important message is understand the geomorphic context and then put your planning and accounting within that geomorphic context as you think forward with sea level rise and other activities. Well, with just 30 seconds remaining, um, our time is, is coming to a close. I want to thank you all for participating. Um, the recording of today's session will be posted on our website, and uh, I will share a link uh, to all participants and registrants. We apologize for anyone who wasn't able to get in, um, as our uh, participation was limited to 100. Uh, the report is very encouraging, um, and it's a critical step towards increasing the global recognition that restoration of coastal wetlands can have a significant climate greenhouse gas reduction mitigate and mitigation benefits. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.